We are so honored to be hosting the great Karen Joy Fowler. Um, the, the last time she was actually in Milwaukee for all, we are all completely beside ourselves and um, it was amazing. And guess what? It's still going to be amazing. Her new novel is Booth, which has been uh, winning awards. It's got a wonderful um, recommendations, advanced recommendations. I love the book and gave it a, a, a bravo theatrical uh, staff rep. I wanted to note that Barbara Vandenberg in USA Today gave it her, the highest rating, four stars out of four, calling the novel profound and empathetic. And if I may quote from Diane Cole in her wonderful Washington Post review, every family shares a stage, but some are more crowded than others. In her <laughs> exquisite new historical novel booth, acclaimed author Karen Joy Fowler raises the curtain on a cast of ego-driven, grief-haunted siblings and parents jostling for a spotlight even as they carelessly shove each other into the shadows, <laughs> the more timid among them. Yes, we know before we turn the first page with the intertwined timeline of the booths in American history will lead, but Fowler's deftly imagined family portrait keeps us riveted. Fowler is the author of six novels, including the New York Times bestseller, The Jane Austen Book Club, and the We Are All Completely Beside Ourselves, winner of the Penn Faulkner Award. And we in Wisconsin are so lucky to have Jane Hamilton, who is conversation partner extraordinaire in person or virtual. She is the author of <laughs> Book of Ruth, Map of the World, both selections of the Oprah's Book Club, as well as the excellent Lombards, which we call, did I get that title right? I was like, where's that other title? And um, <laughs> excellent Lombards, which um, at least one among us calls us, calls the Orchard novel, which is, I'm going to say it. It is, uh, I have read every one of her books and adored them all, but it has a special place. Oh, so um, thank you both so much for joining us. What an honor. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Daniel. Thank you, Daniel. I um, am so thrilled to be doing this with Karen Joy, who I will just say, uh, full disclosure, is um, I am lucky enough to um, count her as a dear friend, and um, but um, I am being completely unbiased when I say <laughs> that I love this book. And, um, and I also, if I didn't know Karen, I would still nonetheless sing praise to Karen, your remarkable and beautiful brain. So um, it's great to see you. It's great to be here. I, you know, my only uh, grief is that when we first talked about this, we were thinking it would be um, in person and that we yes. do it with the, um, in partnership with Boswell's and the Inklink bookstore, which is um, in my neighborhood in southeastern Wisconsin. And Inklink always has a dinner with the author and the food is appropriately themed and taken from the book, which we could talk about later, like what food would be served? At so the we would be eating pigeon, I think. <laughs> oh, right. Yes. Yes, which are no more. Um, well, I just want to, I, I want to start out um, by asking you a very general and probably silly question. And then um, if you would read, that would be great. But um, I just, I read this book twice. And each time I have uh, just had a hard time really imagining what it was like to live with the booths for all the years that you lived with them. And you know so much about their time, their life, their the world around them. And you know, how did you sleep at night? <laughs> um, you know, I've, I in that way that I that I sometimes notice when I'm reading a book, I, like I'm reading a Jane Austen novel or, I, or I'm watching something on television. Um, I am so delighted to be in the company 
of characters who in the flesh, I would not be able to stand for two seconds. Um, and, and when I do uh, find myself with people I find difficult in the flesh, I often get through it by imagining I'm in a Jane Austen novel and that these characters are actually charming me with their foibles. Um, so um, I guess, you know, I, I loved the booze in, in that um, identical way, knowing that um, they would not like me and I would not like them, but, um, <laughs> but you know, with the distance of 200 years, um, I, I found them to be excellent company. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, you also, it seems to me that you love them equally and fairly. Um, I did my best, you know, um, they're, they're a mix because the, the three characters that I look at the most closely are uh, the older sister, Rosalie, and then a, a middle brother, Edwin, and then the younger sister, Asia. And for Edwin and Asia, there is a lot of existing source material. They, Asia wrote three books, um, many, many letters. Edwin wrote many, many letters. Many people who knew Edwin uh, left records of uh, encounters they had with him and impressions they had with him. There's, there's all this material. For Rosalie, there's almost nothing. So uh, I know the things that happened to Rosalie, but I have no sense of who she was. So it's a, in terms of a, a writing project, it was a, a mix of a character that I largely created and then two characters that, um, that I had a, a lot of help in their own words in trying to figure out who they were. And, and one of the, um, uh, effects of this is that um, Asia and Edwin um, are not always as likable as I might have chosen them to be. My writing workshop was just outraged that Edwin, in, uh, as a prerequisite to marrying uh, him, he forced um, his first wife, Mary Devlin, to give up her acting career. He would not marry an actress and um, he insisted that, uh, that she devote herself to, to his career instead, which she was very happy to do. But my writing career, my writing group was outraged, outraged that someone would do this. And they kept, um, they kept expressing their outrage and saying, well, you know, now I don't like him as much as I did. And kept thinking, well, what do you expect me to do about it? <laughs> It, it can't be fixed. Um, so, uh, you know, Rosalie, um, I could make her as likable or as, as uh, prickly as I wanted, but um, uh -huh. Asia and Edwin, I, I had to take them as they were. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, well, would you read a bit so that we can hear yeah. your inimitable style? And then I would love to talk about that inimitable style. <laughs> Easy for you to say. <laughs> I'm, I'm just gonna read a couple of pages from um, the middle of the book. And I've chosen these because, um, because the, the voice of the book allowed me to do certain things that I think these, this section illustrates. So um, it, it's a scene, um, again, from about the middle of the book, the three people in it are John Wilkes, his sister, Asia, and, um, and a friend of his from school, Jesse Borton. And I will just start. Jesse Borton is a handsome boy with a wide smile and an open, readable face. He and John and Asia walk through the woods together, the leaves now more brown than red. But the sun is out and the day is mild enough to sit on the steps down to the spring the place where Asia once made Edwin give her all his pebbles. The boys smoke their pipes and the smell of tobacco wafts about. Asia fills and empties her cupped hand with cold water, listening to the music of it falling, but also to Jesse. He tells a story she's never heard before, 
a story of a wild river and a day in which John, sucked under by a powerful current, nearly drowned, which makes Asia suddenly remember a dream she'd had. She has a brief image of John floating face down amongst books and chairs. For just a moment, she can't breathe. We thought we'd lost him for sure, Jesse says. We thought he'd never open those big eyes for us again. He throws his arm over John's shoulders and John lays his cheek briefly on Jesse's hand. A thin column of smoke rises like a charmed cobra from the bowl of his pipe. No. I'm not to drown, he says, nor burn, nor hang, though my sister has long believed I'm marching towards a martyr's death. Does Asia believe that? She doesn't want to. Years later, she will write that it was a golden afternoon. She will write of her deep contentment, how she watched the two boys leaning together in the sunshine, so gifted, so beautiful, so brilliant, and wondered about their futures. Surely both would leave a shining mark upon the world. Eight years later, in April of 1862, Jesse Wharton will be killed in the Capitol prison in Washington, DC. A captured Confederate, he'll be shot by the sentry on duty. Maybe he stuck his head out of the window, refused to retreat, and abused the sentry with awful oaths and the taunt that he was too cowardly to shoot. Maybe he was quietly minding his own business. In fact, had just looked up from his mother's favorite Bible verse when he was murdered suddenly and without cause. It all depends on whom you ask. All this was known to Asia when she wrote about his shining mark. But on that lovely quiet afternoon, she was unaware and unconcerned. The war was several years and a handful of verses to the beautiful Miss Booth in the future. Mm. I will say, um, I will just say something about um, having chosen a kind of omniscient voice that gave me enormous freedom to move about in time, to include things in, in the book that I know, but the characters do not know. Um, but also, um, even more importantly, I think, to be honest about what I don't know. So that, you know, when I say that, um, that there are these two versions of how Jesse died, um, I am admitting to the fact that I, I don't, you know, probably the truth is something else entirely. I have my suspicions about uh, him being murdered as he read his mother's favorite Bible verse, but um, you can see the reason why um, the two narratives would, would exist, why, why someone would want to tell the story one way and someone would want to tell it another. And this was one of the really tricky things about writing the historical fiction in general, but this particular book is that although there's a great deal of material about the booth, so much of it, it, it occupies the space of mythology. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln, narratives began to move about and, and readjust and, um, and so, uh, you know, determining what I think I know, what I will never know, um, and, and what everybody else seems to think is true, but I don't, those, those were the issues that I was grappling with. And all the time sort of thinking that the whole project of writing a historical novel is actually very dodgy in a lot of ways. <laughs> but, um, um it, well what do you I, I think i know what you mean but can, but can you just define dodgy in these terms but i do want to i don't want to get lost from the fact that um so hold that thought for just a minute that you the way you move through time is is you do it so beautifully and masterfully and um and yes the voice allowed you to do that but not everybody could have handled the material in the sort of the seamless way and and that is um is your mastery so that was that was and i i love that scene that you that you read of that of that particular moment which 
it's it's a it's a beautiful scene. Thank you, thank you. But anyway, um, so what do you mean that it's dodgy? Well, if you believe, as I believe, that um, memory is very unreliable, and if you believe, as I believe, that eyewitness accounts are very unreliable, mm -hmm. and you know you are looking at um, material that is two hundred years old and has been colored by this this you know event, uh, this catastrophic event, um, how can you really believe any of it? You know, it's at, at a certain point, um, the, the historical record is, um, you know, it doesn't bear thinking about. <laughs> but, that, but then doesn't that grant you, the novelist, a certain amount of freedom? Yeah, you know, even despite the fact that we know certain things? Well, I, it does. Um, you know, I uh, obviously, um, even the characters that I had a lot of information about, I assume that readers will understand that I have no access to what Edwin Booth was thinking at any given moment in his life or what the Booths were talking about around the dinner table, you know, that, that I have made up um, a lot of the smaller details and the smaller moments. But, um, but I, you know, I feel, I feel an obligation when I'm dealing with characters who are actually famous, not just historical figures, but famous historical figures, not to accuse them of things they didn't do, or, you know, to, to try um, to try to the be best of my ability to portray them um, as honestly as I can. Uh, well, I think that's another thing that that you do with the the voice and um, your sensibility, which is that you you judge them very gently for um, making errors by virtue of the fact that the time that they they live in makes them commit these errors. But you say things like, um, "It's curious that Asia never thought of herself as a slave owner, even though." you know, the family did. It's, it's, it's interesting to know that, blah, blah, blah. and I just, I felt that was so deftly done. And it was, you're just pointing out that, um, that from this vantage point, we kind of wonder, you know, why didn't you think that, but you, you, you don't judge her harshly for it. You just sort of wonder. And, and I thought that was really well done. Thank you. I think she's, um, she's a hard person to like she you know she's uh has a temper she holds a grudge forever um and yet um i i did have a lot of sympathy for her i think that she's the smartest person in the family um i think she i, I know she's the best educated person in the family and and I think she probably would, in a different time and place, um, have had ambitions for herself uh, and been able to realize them. And um, and she did, you know, she she did have ambitions for herself, but in a very careful way of um, uh, of supporting her brother. So she wrote three books, but um, one of them is about her father. One of them is about uh, her brother Edwin and the third one is about her brother John. So it's it's not um, you know it it, it it's a, a a way of embellishing that their careers rather than actually claiming a space for herself. You know the sun has come and I I'm gonna move. I'm oh, just gonna. Mm -hmm. I do not like I do not like the view here. <laughs> I was trying to think the sun has come. I mean, there's <laughs> several suns in the book. <laughs> um, is that better? That's better. Yeah, okay. now, now I can see. One of the things that no one, as far as I have read notes, is how funny the book is. And it's not exactly a laugh out loud topic, but the to me in this book maybe especially the source of your humor the wellspring is the fact that you are 
the master of understatement. And there's just so many times that I laughed out loud. Like, like um, this is very early on when you're describing um, the father. Um, he's rarely sober, which makes him less helpful than might have been hoped. <laughs> and there's so many sentences like that that just brought me great pleasure. Um, and I wonder if when you're writing, you are LOLing sometimes. I, I am so glad that you point that out. Um, on my, uh, what would it have been, my fifth novel, um, Wits End, I got a very bad review in the New York Times in which the reviewer said, basically, um, if only she had meant to be funny. And I thought, <laughs> of course I meant to be funny. I'm sure, you know, there are times when I'm working and I'm laughing so hard I can hardly type. Um, <laughs> so, you know, whose fault is it if people don't know that you mean to be funny? Is it yours? Is it theirs? Not yours. <laughs> I also love that moment when the mother suggests that Edwin, who wants to be an actor, um, that he be a carbon, that he be a woodworker, and he he thinks to himself, um, he says, um, as if Jesus was remembered for his woodwork. <laughs> but yes. also, also, I just um, you know the specificity of your detail when you're describing little moments. There's a moment when the when the father comes to the farm because one of the children has died, Marianne, and and he's still wearing his costume and he's thwacking the horse with you know Hamlet's the the flat you say of Hamlet's sword and it's it's just so specific and I'm guessing that there was no. Um, there's no record of that moment and that you invented that, but it's, I, I mean, this is again, a case where I'm marveling at your brain. Well, and it's lovely that you're marveling at my brain, but no, there is a record of that. That is not, that is not a moment that I made up. Um, yes, you did. I'm, I'm <laughs> Um, well, you you um, you transcribed it onto this particular page very well. Um, may it may again, you know, be a moment that someone else made up. Uh, you know, the point mm -hmm. that the that the narrative, true or or artifice, is making is that he was in such haste to get to the farm when he got the message about uh, that, that his children were ill, that he, you know, he ran from the stage. He didn't bother to take his costume off. So um, again, that may, you know, that's the way it's remembered. It may very well be true. Um, it also just may be a, a, a way people chose to remember it um, because it made that point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Do you, I mean, the way that you recount the, the acting styles, both of the father and of Edwin, um, makes me think that if we were to see them do that now, we would be completely repelled. Um, and certainly the father, um, but, but Edwin too, I think. Um, and do you, do you feel like you have a real sense of how they sounded and um, because they were very, very dramatic and, and melodramatic and, um, you know, there is actually a place on the internet where you can go and hear Edwin Booth read. Um, it's through a great deal of crackle and noise, but it, it gives me chills every time I listen to it. Wow. So you, you, his, his, there's one little recording from Othello of his voice that you can Google and find. And, um, you know, his father, I think, um, was an actor in the old school that, you know, very bombastic and um, uh, oversized. And Edwin was supposed to be, a, you know, a huge step towards naturalism that um, so much so that, um, again, I think, I, may, I think maybe it's Dickens who says something like, um, you know, uh, about an actor, um, uh, you know, well, when is he going to act? My God, he's not acting at all. Uh, um, but I, I do think, you know, that that move towards naturalism has continued and that we would now find Edwin, you know, quite formal and sort of fossilized, I suspect. 
And, you know, I've seen that over the course of my own lifetime, that, that some of the actors, I name no names, that I admired most when I was a teenager. Um, I watch those same movies and those same actors now, and I think, can't, can't they calm down? Good Lord. <laughs> Get a grip. Uh, um, can you think of any contemporary actors who would... Um, incite a rebellion because they are fighting about who's who's the better actor as as occurred in the Astor Place rebellion. Yeah, that's amazing to think about, isn't it? I, you know, I think that all of that passion and partisanship has been transferred to the soccer pitch. <laughs> and um, so, no, there will be there will be no riots over who's the better Shakespearean actor, but there will definitely there will always be riots over whether that was actually an offside goal or not. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Um, so it, it sounds like John was actually a terrible actor in, you know, especially in relation to his father and his brother. And I, I, I do think of Meryl Streep, who I think probably wanted to say to her three daughters, I will give you each $30 million not to, <laughs> not, there's no way, even if you're average and you have a career, it's really still not going to be good. But, um, but he, he, he really was a, a, a bad actor in terms of his stagecraft, not just his person. I think, you know, there's no denying he was a bad actor in terms of his person, but I actually don't think he was a bad actor in terms of his stagecraft. I think he was much more like his father. So it was much more in that bellicose um, kind of style. And he was apparently, you know, very gifted physical actor. So his sword fighting was much admired. Um, but I think, um, I think that, you know, that his heart was never in it. It was really Edwin's calling as much as Edwin often hated it. Um, he, he saw it as his life's work. And I think John always thought he was made for greater things, that, that he had a destiny and being on stage was not it. I, I think one of the other things another thing that you do so brilliantly is that you and and it's it's a little tricky to say this because you know you are not endorsing the white supremacist but you are uh you have a, a sympathy for the way his life evolved and therefore the way his sensibility evolved and and we understand why he um we understand his craziness i think and so I I, th I thought you did that very deftly, and I and I can imagine that there were times when you felt like you might be courting trouble. I think yeah, I think that, that you know this, this was not only an issue to me, but when I turned the book in, there was much discussion around this. Um, there are a couple couple of things that I would say. One of them is that. I think most of what I got, most of the material I had for John um, came out of his sister's book. Um, so she, as I said, she wrote three books, one about her father, one about Edwin. Those books are very dry. They're very much just sort of a catalog of their achievements on stage. Um, but after the assassination, um, which destroyed her life, um, she wrote a book about John and she was the, the sibling who was the closest to John and her incredible love for her brother just comes through on every page and every anecdote that she tells. So I, I had this um, extremely loving portrait of him. Now, inside that loving portrait, you know, there are things that, um, still appall me, I, you know, Asia is apparently okay with the fact that he sat in his bedroom window and shot dogs um, that wandered into the yard. I am not so okay with that. Uh, so, um, I, you know, I think that, well, I, 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 to back up a little bit, um, I, one of the things that surprised me, because when I started reading about the booths, um, 
what I knew is what I think every American knows that John Wilkes Booth killed Abraham Lincoln, that it happened in, the, in a theater while a play was going on and possibly um, like, that, that he escaped and that, you know, that there was a manhunt for him. And that was about it. I, I didn't know anything about his family. So it was a great surprise to learn um, that his family was actually opposed to slavery um, that they were vegetarians, um, that their Christian values were slippery uh, and uncertain, um, uh, and that, you know, that they were just a very liberal family, that, that they, uh, with the exception of John, that they supported the Union, that Edwin was a great admirer of Abraham Lincoln, um, that, that John was really an outlier. And um, I think uh, that um, that he, that his politics were forged not in the family but at boarding school is my impression. He had a relatively brief stint at a very posh boarding school where he was with the sons of wealthy planters and slave owners and um, and his virulent. Um, white supremacy and, and his uh, passionate support of slavery uh, as something that not only benefited white people, but was enormously beneficial to black people as well. I think that all came out of that period where he was uh, at boarding school. And then even though these, um, these positions were so out of sync with the rest of the family, um, he was so adored by the women in the family. His mother and his sisters just thought the sun rose and set on him. And his father by then was dead. So there was just kind of no one to provide a corrective or to argue, uh, argue the other position. And I have completely forgotten what your question was. Oh, the, whether um, the, the I, sympathy I, for John. That, you know, there are moments where I do feel um, uh, I do feel a lot of sympathy in, in a kind of bewildered way. Like um, after his father's death, um, there was no money, and they moved back to the farm. And John, you know, the whole burden of supporting the family falls on John. He's supposed to be a farmer, which he is no good at. He's, um, you know, f f fifteen years old or so, fourteen, fifteen. Um, and there are three adult women in the family and they leave it entirely to him that there is no sense that, that, that there's anything they can do that you know, the family will um, starve or not starve based on, uh, on this young man. And that's just kind of astonishing to me that uh, you know, particularly that his mother didn't, that his mother didn't think, well, this is too much to put on on one person. But having said that, um, let me be perfectly clear. I do not like John Wilkes Booth. I do not think he was a nice person in any way. Um, and, you know, I think the first time you see him in the book, he's torturing cats. So I don't mm -hmm. expect other people will like him much either. Right. Well, um, you could understand his appeal. That's what I'll say. Yeah. And, um, and his charm and his curls and his um, pluck. Um, but he also always, and I think this starts with his mother, um, you know, had a sense of himself as an important person from a very young age. And that maybe that's not the best thing to, to give a child. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when when I, I read children should be made to understand how very unimportant they are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I well, I have a friend who's uh, who had her daughter's chart read by an astrologer when she was 15. And he told her she would be a world leader. And I just thought, oh, this is this <laughs> anyway. Um, 
but speaking of world leader, um, when I read um, this in manuscript um, a while ago, there were the Abraham Lincoln parts did not exist. And, and I, it was your editor, I think, who said, you know, we should have, we should hear from Lincoln periodically. And I thought when I heard that and that you were going to insert Lincoln <laughs> throughout the book, I just thought, how the hell are you going to do that? I mean, how do you how do you you know take the this mythological person and and sort of slip him in here and there? And I thought you did that really well. And the things that you chose to highlight um, were were just so. And it seemed to me that you did that fairly quickly. So how did you do that? I did do that fairly quickly, but. Um... It was also great fun, you know, it was uh, mostly I was guided by chronology so that, uh, you know, I wanted I wanted us to follow Lincoln's life um, simultaneously. So, you know, it would be 19, uh, 1838 for the booths. So I would just go look, you know, what where was Lincoln in 1838 and, you know, what was he doing? And um, and he was, you know, he's. Um, become a mythological figure, I think inevitably, and John Wilkes Booth has something to do with that fact, but he was also just peculiar, you know, and um, and his own politics were very slippery from, from time to time, you know, he was hardly a champion of ending slavery um, until he had to do it, um, but uh, you know, uh, there um, the things I, the things that appeal to me and the things that I'm drawn to are the are the humanizing things like the fact that um, the neighbors uh, would occasionally see him rushing from the house half dressed because his wife is chasing him with a broom, um, att attempting to beat him around the head and shoulders with it. Uh, <laughs> um. We, I don't, I'm kind of hogging you here, so I'm just going to look at the questions, but um, I, I just, I just want to say a friend of mine uh, mentioned that Lincoln actually wanted to see Aladdin the night that he was going to go see um, My American My Cousin. American Cousin. Did you, did you come upon that? Did I did know? not. My impression was that he just, he wanted to stay home. He did not want to go out at all, but he, uh, uh, John Ford had advertised that he would be there uh -huh. and had also advertised that um, Grant and his wife would be there. But Grant's wife said, I will not spend another evening in the company of Mary Todd Lincoln, <laughs> no matter what you do. So, um, oh, dear. Um, so uh, new dinner partners had to be found, uh, theater partners. Um, all but right. no, I, I didn't even know that Aladdin was being performed then. How do they do the genie? I don't know. I don't know. I'll, I'll get back to you on that. Who wrote the music? <laughs> a whole new world. <laughs> um, but I did. I, I have a question here from from um, a, a um, bookstore person. But I, I just want to ask you, um, I, I know you read a lot of Shakespeare and you're and you um, and you you quote wonderfully just little snippets here and there. But did you also read the current plays of the time? Like for example, you um, talk about the play The Iron Chest, and then there's My American Cousin. Did you did you read those plays? I did read those plays. Um, I don't know that it um, that it, it, there. I started actually because I started reading the plays because. Um, Edwin made his screen debut in Richard III playing the part of Trestle. And um, people in the audience said that he was barely audible. But, you know, it was not a, not a great success. People could hardly hear him delivering his speeches. So I went to Richard III to see what Trestle's speeches were. And he doesn't have any. It's a, it's a part with no speeches at all. And so this was, a, a revelatory moment to me when I first understood that the Richard III that was being performed then was not actually Shakespeare's Richard III, but was Sibber Colley's um, adaptation of Shakespeare's Richard III. And 
um, and there, you know, there are significant changes. Um, uh, it's much shorter. It's much bloodier, uh, and and um, the adaptation for King Lear, uh, different different adapter whose name is not now coming to my mind. But um, my understanding is that when George the Third went mad, it became difficult to perform King Lear. <laughs> and so it was significantly rewritten. And the King Lear that our ancestors saw ends with Cordelia being crowned and married. And, you know, it's just a, a, a triumph of, um, of happiness uh, at the end of the version they saw. So that started me thinking, I better, I better read these plays. I better try to find these plays. I couldn't find all of them but I read the ones that I could. And the tricky thing about Our American Cousin is that um, th this is a play that was um, had an author in England, but when it came to the US, a woman named Laura Keene adapted it. Um, she was one of the very few women who had her own company and her own stage. And, um, and she made significant changes to the original that, um, and, and it was a, an evolving work over you know, many months where they, they kept changing it and kept changing it. And characters who were quite um, uh, practically invisible in the original became uh, main characters and, um, so again, it's hard, you can go read the play, but it's hard to know if you're actually reading what was being performed. And you know, it was enormously successful having, having done that. Um, some people left Laura Keene's company and they went to Philadelphia and they began to perform, uh, because Laura Keene was in New York, began to perform Laura Keene's version uh, and she sued them. Um, and, and it was nine years in the courts trying to decide if someone could own the way a line was delivered or could own the gestures um, that an actor gave the line. <coughs> and the end of Laura Keene's um, part in this particular story is a sad one because she was performing um, in that play when Lincoln was killed and, and because Mary fell apart, Laura Keene went up to the box and, um, and held the president's head in her lap until he could be moved. <coughs> and that too was kind of the end of her career because she was a comic actress and now she was so deeply entwined in this tragic story that wow. no, nobody thought she was funny anymore. No, oh my goodness. Um, Lisa Eckstein wonders, says, your collection, What I Didn't See, includes two stories about the booths. So you've been writing about them for a while. Can you talk about returning to the material and whether you were already thinking about a novel then? Yeah, I, I was not thinking about a novel. Um, the first short story I wrote <coughs> is called Standing Room Only. And it's a time travel story. The, uh, uh, the idea I had, the way it came about is that I had read some time travel stories and I was annoyed with how easily people from the future were able to blend in the past with you know, just a sort of change of clothing and, and you're good to go. Um, and I thought, first of all, I thought time travel would actually just be a form of tourism. And I live in Santa Cruz, this is a tourist town. I know the tourists, they're not blending in. Um, I can spot the tourists. And so I thought, um, I went from that to thinking there would probably be destination vacations, package deals. And then this is a, a grim thought I can't defend in any way. But um, my next thought was that people would go see uh, the night Lincoln was killed. And so I wrote a story in which Washington DC is a wash in time travelers. They've all, they've all come to, um, to try to get into the theater and, and watch the performance. Um, in the course of doing the research for that story, which was mostly around the conspiracy and, and the assassination itself, 
I read a, a, an account from the New York Times, which was um, uh, in, in uh, you know, in the, in the microfiche from, from the period we're talking about of Edwin Booth's return to the stage after the assassination. Um, so he, he, his initial impulse was that he would never be able to go on the stage again, and it would be unseemly for a booth to, to ever act or be in the public eye again. And he lasted about nine months, um, I think partly because this was his life's work, but also partly because the entire family was dependent on him financially. And if he ceased to make money, um, then, you know, it, it was a large family. He was supporting them all. And it was, that was just a very moving account. And so I wrote another story about that, about that night. And then the novel came about because um, I was having one of my all too frequent periods of despair about gun control in this country and, uh, and started thinking, and I'm not the first writer to do so, about the families of the shooters. And I was thinking, you know, that obviously the families of the victims are going through something unendurable. But the families of the shooters have their own special horror to face. And, um, and because I was already so immersed in the booths, it was a, a natural step from there to, to wondering what the impact on the booths, uh, on the brothers and sisters of the assassination was. Something I did not know the answer to. So I began to um, go read about that. I began to torment my friends with funny stories about the booths. And at a certain point, people began to say to me, just write a novel. <laughs> stop, stop bothering me. Go, go put it on a page somewhere. Well, we're grateful to the friends. Um, <laughs> Athena Kildegard, hello, Athena, says, um, can you talk about the narrator of Ruth some more? Did you think of the narrator as an ex the omniscient narrator as an extension of yourself, or did you imagine the narrator as someone situated in time and place? I absolutely imagine the narrator as a extension of myself. This is, you know, this, this is me um, absolutely stepping onto the page in a very bossy way saying, you know, this is, this is what I think you should be noticing about the story I'm telling you. This is what you don't know, but uh, are gonna be so fascinated to learn. Uh, this, is, this is all my reactions to the material are in the, in the omniscient voice. Which I wonder if what, that would be harder to do if you were um, just sort of writing something that you were making up that was not, was not rooted in history. I, I mean, yeah, I, I'm sure it, you know, I mean, what would be the, uh, what would be the point of objecting to the things that I myself have concocted? Uh, <laughs> That, that, that seems quarrelsome, unnecessarily quarrelsome. <laughs> um, one of the things that I thought was comforting about the book in a very maybe perverse way was the fact that, um, uh, the, that our time, which seems so um, egregiously um, uh, unpleasant and violent and screwed up and desperate, really, um, the time that you're writing about is is very much the same, and there were yes. just there, was, there were so many parallels and uh, and and ways to just feel very comfortable in that time because it is still our time. Yes, I think you know uh, uh, as I said, I started with the issue of gun control, but um, but the issues got um, expanded from that to uh, you know the sort of uh, and again. Uh, you know, a lot of this was around the uh, the 2016 election, just as sort of such a clear demonstration that the issues that um, of the Civil War are not issues that we have solved or even really made much movement towards solving. So um, I'm not sure where the comfort comes in. I guess just that you you feel at home in the Civil War period, but well. And also, you know, we tend to think that our time is the worst 
ever. Um, when, uh, you know, in fact, I think um, civil um, unrest is, is actually not as great as it was in the 60s and 70s. I mean, it's um, so, so yeah. it's, just, it's just nice to know that maybe we'll get through this too. I, this is um, something also that I thought a lot about because um, because I grew up during the 60s um, that I, I don't think that people who are not my age have ever really taken in the constant drumbeat of assassinations that we lived through, that um, every conceivable um, black leader was killed um, sometimes, you know, sometimes by uh, by the Klan, but sometimes by our own government. And then, you know, the Kennedys um, uh, and, and Lumumba, uh, that it was just, it was such a feature of life at that time. And, um, you know, there's always a lot of talk about how we're the first generation to grow up with the uh, with the threat of nuclear war, but there's, it seems to me there's been far less attention paid to the fact that that assassination was just a very um, frequent part of our, our lives. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, okay, so I have a couple more questions and, um, um, and some from here, but, um, how are you going to shed the booths or, or, or have you yet? Uh, that's, a, that's a really good question. I will say at this point, I'm, I'm sick of them. I, I, <laughs> I love them for a long time. I'm tired of them. Um, and I'm also sort of tired of, uh, of the, the, project of a historical novel. I have no idea what I will do next, but I do think it's going to be very short and it is not going to be historical and there will not be a booth to be seen. <laughs> Having said that, I do still dream about them. I dream about the farm um, where they lived and, um, and uh, you know, I am, a, I am a ghostly presence in their lives, in my dreams. Um, well, one of the things, speaking of dreams, that, um, that you portray so well is the sense of the inexhaustible wilderness that the booths would have felt was available to them. And I, I have, um, I have periods where I long for wilderness in a, in a kind of inchoate, just kind of pure, I, uh, and 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 it's it's not anything that will ever be available to me because the, at the the level that I think I want it is is doesn't exist really anymore. Um, but I also, in this romance that I have about wilderness, um, wonder if I really would be up to it. <laughs> and I think about, you know, the booths and, and they lived in the middle of nowhere and they were farming, but still, you know, just the, the, the hardship of, of being in wilderness and the, the beauty, yes, but the hardship. Yeah, I'll say a couple of things about that. Um, first of all, um, when my mother died, uh, which was a great loss to me, I was very grief stricken. All I wanted was to be somewhere wild. It seemed like the only thing that would make me feel better would be wilderness. Um, and, 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 you know, again, something I couldn't really produce at that time. But I, it was, a, I don't know, just an interesting thing to notice that that, that seemed like, you know, the, the most healing thing that, um, that, that I could do would be to to find myself somewhere wild. Having said that, yes, I share your suspicions about how I would really handle it. And, and this is something too that I think I knew quite early in my reading life, that it was so much better to sit on my bed and read about an adventure than to actually have one because they looked 
uncomfortable. They looked cold frequently. Um, they looked terrifying. They looked arduous. Uh, I, I was born to read books. <laughs> So noted. Um, <laughs> leads us to our last question here about, from Susan Keenan. Um, what writers, living or dead, do you particularly admire? Oh man, what a what a hard question. Where to stop? You know, I'm really um, I really like books. I I'm uh, I'm I'm ready to be pleased when I pick up a book. I am not looking for the thing that will. Um, throw me out or, or uh, you know, dismantle me in some way. I, I, and, and I don't need a book to do everything well. I, you know, I'm, I'm perfectly capable of admiring the things a book does do well and, and letting go of things that maybe the book does not do well. So um, that's just a long way of saying that if, uh, if, if you want me to talk about the books I like, it's most of them. Most, <laughs> most books are things that I like. Um, well, you have a, you are um, featured in, by the book in the New York Times book review this week. And so, um, and you mentioned many books that you love uh, uh, and it's a, it's a wonderful, and if I haven't seen the real thing, but if you go online and get it, it's an extended conversation with you, and um, and it's it's really it's great. Thank um, you. And also, I just can testify that you are an extremely generous reader. I you know I don't like I don't think of it that way. I think that I um, like I said that I. Uh, um, that I, I just know what is working and I'm not so concerned about what is not working. And maybe that's generous, but maybe, you know, maybe the book is just what it's doing well. It's doing so well that I, I'm, you know, uh, disarmed. Um, <laughs> the, the critic in me is disarmed by the things in a book that please me. Well, Ellen Bravo says, Karen Joy, we are all completely Hi, beside ourselves. Hi, to have Ellen. You here. Thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to um, reiter reiterate that, Karen. Thank you. It's so great to see you. And again, um, um, I, I heart this book. I, I, I love all the booths. Um, and I do have one last thing, which is um, what was, because Rosalie, about whom very little is known, and Karen, you know, got to invent her more freely than she did the others because um, little is known. But it is known, apparently, that she did, was in love with a lion tamer. And, yes. and, and, and where did that little piece crop up? Um, I, I had an amazing research experience with the booths, which is um, that I, um, I, I had read a, a really magnificent biography of John Wilkes Booth by a man named Terry Alford. And there was a story in it about Edwin that I really liked and that I really wanted, but that I could find in no other book. And in a book that's really meticulously footnoted, this one story was not. So I emailed, I, I found Terry Alford's email through his publisher and I emailed him and I said, you know, can you just point me to the source for this story? I'm, I'm writing a novel about the booze. And he emailed back instantly and he said, um, you're writing a novel about the booze. I have been researching this family for 30 years. Would you like to see my papers? Oh my goodness. And, and he, boxed them up and he handed them over to me. And the wonderful, wonderful story about Rosalie's tragic love affair with the lion tamer was in those papers. Was it a, a love that was requited, do you think, or? I am guessing not, uh -huh. but um, it certainly burned brightly in her heart oh. um, over the years because there was never another. Um, much less someone with the legs and physique of the lion tamer. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's just one of those moments um, 
that that historical um, material does provide where you're just thinking, oh my God, I could never have made this up. No. What could be better? What could no. be better? <laughs> uh, well, this. So thank you so much for, for being here. Oh, Jane, uh, thank you so much. I love you so much. I love you too. And thank you, Daniel. And thank you for um, those of you who were here. And um, we'll see you soon, I hope. We have a link to um, Karen J. Fowler's um, New York Times uh, by the book. I was excited. I just bought the first kind of French for my sister actually last week. And she, I think, went out and bought the next however many more there are at Politics and Prose. Um, we also have another link to purchase. The copies are signed. Please make sure you ask for your signed copy. We're grateful that they were able to put that together. Um, and uh, you can read more about everything about the booths, including the love that dare not roar its name, I guess you'd say. Um, the lion tamer. <laughs> <laughs> the lion tamer. I would just like to say one more thing because I've gotten some reactions to the by the book. And um, one of the things that I talk about are some of the books that I loved when I was a child. And that's what people respond to. People are so excited to talk about the books they read when they were young. Um, as am I. Yeah. <laughs>